I'm very pleased now to move right to our closing keynote address. Uh, plenty of things to reflect on from this morning's discussion and into this last panel already. And I can't think of anybody who would be uh, better to, again, take us back to the big picture of what uh, medical innovation and getting more value from medical innovation, making the the, the development process more efficient uh, and effective for patients can really mean than Peter Orzag. Uh, Peter is currently the Vice Chairman of Global Banking at Citigroup. He's also a member of Citigroup's Senior Strategic Advisory Group, and in addition, he serves as an adjunct senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, from January 2009 through July 2010, Peter was the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, where he was responsible for oversight of the administration's budget policy, coordination, and implementation of a wide range of major policy initiatives, reviews of federal regulatory action, and uh, as all of you know, a major role in health care reform. That interest in effective health care reform, including a focus on technology and innovation, uh, goes way back um, uh, in Peter's career, as I know from my personal interactions with him, uh, back before that work at OMB to when he was Director of the Congressional Budget Office, and before that to when he spent time right here at the Brookings Institution as the Joseph Peckman Senior Fellow and Deputy Director of Economic Studies. Uh, Peter has also co-authored a number of books and is currently a member, among other organizations, of the Institute of Medicine uh, and, as I said, the Council on Foreign Relations. So please join me in welcoming Peter to the podium. Thank you. It's great to be back at uh, Brookings. Uh, let me say a couple remarks about uh, the broader context in which we face ourselves. I think it is now uh, well known that the rate at which healthcare costs grow is the primary determinant of our long-term fiscal future, as can be seen very clearly from this chart. Between now and 2050, Social Security, for example, is projected to rise from 5% of the economy to 6. Medicare and Medicaid and other federal health expenditures are projected to rise from 55 to 12. So uh, our success or failure at containing future cost growth will be a much more important determinant of our long-term fiscal future than either the deal that was just reached on discretionary spending or, frankly, uh, the other measures that are under discussion now, important though they are. This, what you're struggling with in this room is the crucial long-term fiscal, uh, fiscal problem facing the United States. Now, more specifically with regard to the topic of this conference, most of the analyses that have been done on past cost growth in the United States suggests that a very large share comes from technology-related changes in the health sector. And as you can see across the bottom uh, row there, on the order of magnitude of about half of the cost increases historically, a continued uh, crucial role on a going forward basis. But if that's all that uh, the, the only story that was out there, this would be a very easy conference to uh, attend, and it would be very clear what should happen. The complexity comes because many of those technological advances have significantly improved health outcomes. And as this chart shows, which tries to account for the decline in mortality from coronary disease in the United States over a two-decade period, about half of the decline, and the very significant declines were experienced, about half of the decline occurred because of changes in uh, health risk factors, and in particular, declines in smoking and uh, so on and so forth, more than offsetting the increase in obesity rates. But the other half came from medical devices and technology. And therein lies the central tension that is the focus of this conference. We cannot afford open-ended, continued cost increases dri driven largely by technology or uh, primarily by technology, but on the other hand, we don't want to lose the advances in health outcomes that are associated with a variety of technological improvements. A further problem is that Medicare and Medicaid play such a central role in our overall health system, and our political system has become increasingly polarized. There's a new book uh, out called The Big Sort, not The Big Short, but The Big Sort, documenting that we are increasingly moving into politically segregated neighborhoods. Republicans are increasingly moving into Republican neighborhoods. Democrats are moving into Democratic neighborhoods. All of the social psychology shows that when you put like-minded people together, they go to extremes. 
That is then exacerbated by gerrymandering and exacerbated by the blogosphere and the cable news cycle. And the result is an increasingly dysfunctional political process. This is not uh, just an impression. You can measure the probability that a Republican votes with Democrats or that a Democrat votes with Republicans. And by that measure of polarization, we were at abnormally low levels post-World War II. And as you can see, started to increase in the late 1970s. It's now higher, basically, than it's ever been. That is a fundamental problem facing a system that relies uh, to a significant degree at its heart on Medicare and other federal programs. So in, in the face of these various challenges, there are basically two conceptual approaches. You heard a bit about uh, one of them this morning, uh, a more consumer-directed approach. You, you certainly hear a lot about that from Representative Ryan. I'm going to come back to him in a moment. Uh, and the other approach is focused more on providers and trying to drive value in terms of incentives facing providers. Uh, I want to immediately say these two approaches are not necessarily incompatible and they could be done in concert, but there is a question about relative emphasis even in a combination approach, and let me talk about both of them. The fundamental theory of the case behind the consumer-directed approach is that uh, the fundamental reason we don't have more value driven through even technological change is that consumers do not have enough skin in the game, and if they did, they would drive uh, increased value. The fundamental limitation, however, is that even under a consumer-directed approach, we would still have very deep third-party insurance against high costs, for example, under a health savings account, which is one of the most uh, salient manifestations of the consumer-directed approach. You have uh, full insurance above some threshold. And then the majority of overall healthcare costs are driven by those high-cost cases. And the combination of those two, so for example, this chart shows that the top 5% of Medicare beneficiaries, if you rank them by cost, account for more than 40% of cost. The top 25% of beneficiaries account for 85% of cost. Consumer-directed approaches have their biggest effect on the other 75% of beneficiaries who are disproportionately below the thresholds, but they only account for 15% of cost. And so you get some traction, but not as much as is often promised. Now, there's been a lot of discussion of Mr. Ryan's approach, which embodies this consumer-directed plan for the future of Medicare. And I want to be very clear. Mr. Ryan's plan does reduce federal expenditures on Medicare. And it not only does that, but it provides greater certainty around that federal path, at least on paper. But it is often, I don't think any of us would view it as a great accomplishment if all we did was we reduce federal expenditures and shifted costs onto beneficiaries with no impact on overall costs. The whole theory of the case has to be to reduce overall costs. And that is the rhetoric that you hear that because of the consumer choice, you'd bring down overall costs. What did the Congressional Budget Office find when it analyzed Mr. Ryan's plan? The first thing it did find was a reduction in Medicare expenditures relative to the baseline, from $8,600 to $8,000 in 2022. That part is clear. Now again, if all we were doing is shifting onto beneficiaries, no great shakes. What CBO found, however, was you had some benefit from the increased consumer choice against a, uh, a small base, and so you didn't get that much traction, being more than offset by higher administrative costs through private insurance plans and less negotiating leverage than Medicare, with the result being that it was not that you just shifted costs onto beneficiaries with no, redu with no reduction in overall costs. It's much worse than that. You are shifting costs onto beneficiaries, and overall costs go up, not down, because those two final factors dominate any benefit from increased consumer-directed behavioral changes, and to a shockingly large degree that grows over time. So this plan, which is often being held out as reducing overall costs, at least as evaluated by the Congressional Budget Office, does not reduce overall health care spending on the backs of seniors. It raises overall health care costs on the backs of seniors. And I don't think that's gotten as much attention as it should. Now, Speaker Gingrich uh, would presumably say, based on what I understand his comments to have been this morning, that that just demonstrates yet again how silly the Congressional Budget Office is. 
Now, what I would say is two things. First, I, I actually take his uh, criticisms quite seriously. I did when I was the director of the Congressional Budget Office. I invited him in to actually present what his approach would mean, because it's easy to say we should take into account new developments in scoring. It's harder to know, well, what exactly does that mean? That meeting never took place. I think it is easy to critique OMB and CBO. They are not perfect. But the relevant question is, what's the alternative? What's the specific credible alternative to the system that we have in place? And that I have not seen. Okay, so if, we, if the consumer-directed approach has, if best, limited benefits and maybe actually some harm in terms of overall costs, if you believe the most recent Congressional Budget Office analysis, what are we left with? I think fundamentally we, were, we are left with a provider value approach in which we recognize that those high cost cases, the top 25% of beneficiaries, are where the money is. And we also recognize that in those cases, to a first approximation, the health care that's delivered for most Americans is what the provider is recommending. Therefore, if you combine those two uh, observations, the only way that you're going to contain health care costs over the long term is by affecting what the providers are recommending. And what does that then entail? I think it entails two reinforcing things. The first is a much better information flow. We, over the next uh, decade, next five to 10 years, we will have a significantly expanded health information technology backbone in the United States. That health IT backbone will throw off a lot more information than what is currently available even through registries. And if used well in a comparative effectiveness research setting, could then feed back onto clinical decision support software built into the HIT systems so that I, what I would want in five or 10 years is to be able to walk into my doctor's office, not have to fill out the annoying paper forms, give the doctor permission to access my records, and have the doctor have a set of best practice guidelines pop up from one of the professional bodies if I'm going to see some, a doctor about a heart problem, the American College of Cardiology, and so on and so forth, and then frankly to be able to click through to the underlying information behind those protocols to see whether my individual circumstances varied from that best practice protocol. That should be feasible to do in the United States. I think it would be reinforced in one of the uh, things that was left out, I think, unfortunately, from the Health Act is a change in our medical malpractice system, not along the lines that are typically pr uh, proposed where all you're doing is reducing or imposing caps on liability, but instead getting at the fundamental premise of the medical, mal medical malpractice system, which is based on a best practices methodology, you ha or a common practices beth methodology, I'm sorry. So you have to, in order to avoid liability, uh, you have to uh, basically do what the guy down the hallway is doing or the woman down the hallway is doing because that defines common practice. The common practice standard, however, is nebulous, often not fully scientifically informed. It would be much better to have a safe harbor for evidence-based guidelines put forward by professional bodies. If my doctor is following an evidence-based protocol put forward by an accredited professional body and can show that he or she did that, I shouldn't be able to sue the doctor. So in OBGYN settings, for example, where 80 or 90% of the so-called problematic babies are not because of a mistake by the doctor or the hospital, but because uh, sometimes births are complicated, if you can show that you were following the best practice guidelines, you wouldn't be liable for medical malpractice. That would reinforce this flow. The other thing that needs to happen is a change in the payment system. Where currently we're paying for quantity, we need to move to paying for quality. It's easy to say, hard to do. Uh, and what I would say, and just to close on that, is uh, given that we need to take politics out of the equation, under uh, Mr. Ryan's approach, he's trying to take politics out of the equation by just empowering consumers, but without really giving a lot of specificity about how we would alter the payment system towards value instead of uh, quantity, except for a bank shot from consumers, which may not work and CBO has suggested would not work. And indeed, also in, in Mr. Gingrich's comments this morning, I had a chance to look over the written comments. There was basically nothing on, there's a lot on let's put more money into research, not very much more on how do we make sure the research is oriented towards value and not just more, except in paragraph seven or item seven, a bunch of pilot projects and experimentation at CMS, which is exactly the approach adopted in the Affordable Care Act, 
ironically. So where does that leave us? Uh, I think the, the key issue at this point is uh, much of what was being discussed on the previous panel that I had an opportunity to hear, which is what do we mean by value? How do we measure it? There are different approaches that exist uh, abroad, and uh, there may have been discussion of that earlier. Uh, for example, as you know, in the pharmaceutical setting, in France, there are five different categories based on the degree of advancement or the degree of improvement in a new drug. In Austria, there are three different categories for the same uh, topic. There are a variety of proposals floating around to move in that direction in the United States, and frankly, I don't see I don't see a significant alternative. It's hard for me to argue against uh, either patent life or reimbursement rates, depending on whether there's a significant advance or a trivial advance from a new technology. Uh, doctors Pearson and Bach at Sloan Kettering have an idea that has been proposed to reimburse new technologies or drugs in the United States for some period of time. They said three years. Uh, and if after that period, they have not shown improved medical efficacy relative to existing technologies. It's not that you wouldn't allow those technologies, the new ones, to be reimbursed. It's just that they would be reimbursed at the rate of the old technology. So it's getting at the same concept, which is that uh, if you have not actually improved medical efficacy, you don't get paid more than an existing technology. We're not going to have new technology just for new technology's sake. We're going to have new technology to improve outcomes and improve value. Just to close on this, if you tried to get that proposal through the normal legislative process in the polarized political environment that I mentioned, I don't think you'd have a very good chance. One of the reasons that uh, the administration put so much weight on trying to take more of the politics out of this system, including through the Independent Payment Advisory Board, which very importantly in this kind of polarized environment changes the default so that proposals are adopted unless they are specifically uh, overridden as opposed to the opposite. One of the reasons that it did that is precisely to try to encourage innovative new value-based or, or uh, payment systems that are oriented towards value into the system in a more facile way than our current system. So I guess I would just close by saying this. There have been many criticisms of uh, that fundamental approach. Uh, some of them warranted, some of them exaggerated. But given the absence of uh, a clear pathway from an exclusively consumer-directed approach to any significant cost reductions, let alone actually avoiding cost increases, I think the question we always need to be asking is, what is the plausible alternative? We have, we, it is easy to keep talking and talking, but it's hard to actually move forward. We need to avoid just spinning around in circles because that entails a future that is utterly unsustainable. And I think we need to be moving aggressively towards a new healthcare system backed by much more intense health IT, reinforced by comparative effectiveness research, and with an evolutionary approach to a better payment system that emphasizes value and not quantity. Thank you. You can move over towards the, the, the middle a little bit here. Um, I like being in the middle. That's right. I know you do. Um, we uh, have just a, a few minutes for a little bit of a wrap-up discussion here, and I wanted to start that out with uh, picking up on your comment about the politics and also about the approach to reform being kind of divided along the side of provider-side incentives and consumer-side incentives and reforms. And you mentioned briefly in passing that, well, maybe they're not uh, really all that in conflict, and maybe it's more of an issue of emphasis. And I wonder if we could build on that a little bit more. It does seem like from hearing from some of the panels earlier, Reed and, and other payers in particular, that um, they do see these as, as reinforcing each other. And in particular, uh, they are trying to set up uh, health insurance plans where if you have a serious chronic disease and you go to providers who do uh, a measurably better job of getting better outcomes, reducing complications, using all that uh, evidence-based medicine that you described, uh, they would get substantial savings. You know, they're not just because they're high cost individuals doesn't mean they can't get a big financial benefit from uh, making the most.
most of the evidence that's uh, out there and, and taking advantage of information in particular on providers that are in turn uh, using this uh, better evidence on what's available on medical technologies to get the most benefits for patients at the lowest cost. And I think that's some of the uh, reason behind the emphasis that um, Paul Ryan and others have put on the consumer side, that they think that can actually be a fairly powerful force. Is that really that much in conflict with the uh, with the provider side reforms that Medicare and other payers might undertake directly? If all you do is bank, you put all your chips down on consumer-directed health care, which is effectively, with respect to my friend Mr. Ryan, what his budget does. The probability that you succeed strikes me as exceedingly low, given, and the CBO analysis underscores the risk involved. It's not like it's a, a risk-free thing to do. And that's, by the way, even if you continue to implement the program and you don't have such backlash that what's written on paper is not what's, what's implemented. In order for the combined approach to work, you need two things. You need more comparative effectiveness research. It is hard for me to know how a consumer, under a pure consumer-directed approach, would really know whether that MRI is worth it or not worth it without more of that public good. And yet that has become so politicized. The irony is cons comparative effectiveness research should be among the only things, among one of very few uh, number, uh, limited number of things, that both the pure provider uh, perspective and the pure consumer perspective agree on, because you need it for both to work. The second thing is, uh, again, as you move away from the pure consumer-directed approach, that all we're going to do is set up a premium support approach and assume that that will then feed through into better incentives for technology and for uh, utilization, you do need to worry about, assuming, again, you're not in that extreme, the incentives under Medicare. So how are you going to take the incentives that are built into the fee-for-service system and start migrating them towards fee-for-value? If you, if you kind of dial back those two key things, I think you're then in a, a world where you know, both the consumer side and the provider side come into play. So for example, on the Pearson-Bach approach, not only would the reimbursement rate be affected, but presumably you'd also want uh, co-payments to be affected by the degree of advance of a new technology. And, that's and they, something would, they that, would reinforce each other. That's something that Medicare should potentially be thinking about too? In my view, oh. yes. Okay. Um, let me open up to, we have time for maybe one or two comments from, uh, uh, from out uh, here. So uh, Nancy, do uh, you want to start? One of the problems with the politicization um, was that the comparative effectiveness research written right into the legislation was that no decisions about coverage could be made based on that comparative effectiveness research. Uh, really stunning, actually, um, and, and made some people happy, but clearly didn't serve the needs. How are we going to get beyond that? Well, I think that's, uh, look, there are a whole variety of manifestations of the uh, polarized environment in which we find ourselves. And uh, I don't have a, I mean, this, this is a much broader problem. I don't have, a, you're asking a narrow question, but it's reflective of a much broader problem. I do not have an answer, because the polarization is reflecting some deep structural changes that I mentioned. And it, it is, frankly, at this point, the technical debates about how you measure value, uh, which, by the way, remind me of economist debates about the right discount rate, which can become, you know, it, 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 it becomes uh, philosophical at some point, and at some point you just need to decide and move forward, recognizing that everything is imperfect in life. In any case, those issues strike me, while important, as much less challenging than the fact that our country has increasingly uh, become averse to dealing with gradual long-term problems before their crises. We're going to deal with a crisis, but we won't deal with anything before it's a crisis. And that is a fundamental problem. And the point you're making is just one reflection of that deeper problem. Doug, I think we have time for, for one more. I think the comment in the back was, uh, that was the next hand up. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to mention it. There, there tends to be this fallacy that medical technology and medical devices are driving the cost growth. And we all recognize that healthcare costs are growing and they're forecast to grow for, at uh, greater rates in the future. Yet I think it's very important to add to that discussion the fact that 
an analysis of national health expenditures by the former chief actuary so, um, of CMS found that uh, medical devices represented 5 to 6 percent, and that was constant over a decade. And when it, with respect to pricing, uh, the device growth, device growth pricing was lower than CPI, lower than medical CPI, and other measures. So I think that the benefits of technology, which are tremendous both within the healthcare system itself, as procedures have moved from long inpatient stays to brief outpatient visits, as patients have gained new abilities to live independently on their own without the resources of their, uh, their spouse or their family members. Um, I think in the broader context, the vast improvements in healthcare or that the health status of seniors in particular is underrated and not uh, considered to the full extent it should be. So I think those are important when you consider these uh, uh, recipes for reducing the cost growth. Well, again, look, uh, you mentioned medical devices. We can parse. I mean, medical devices are a small share. Pharmaceuticals are only about 10% of total healthcare spending. You can keep walking through the array of what at least most people uh, describe as devices and technology and, and medical innovations. Uh, and indeed, if you look at the cross-country comparisons, it's not like one area uh, has higher costs in the United States. One, you know, one subsector has higher costs than uh, the other countries, and that explains the whole delta. Instead, it's spread throughout uh, different components of the health system. Yet again, and that's, by the way, why I put up the chart on the improvements in, in mortality from coronary disease, showing the benefits of some of the uh, technologies. The question becomes whether we're getting as much for that spend as we can. And as long as the payment system remains oriented towards just more and not better, I think the clear answer to that is no. The payment system and even some of the consumer uh, incentives as well. To, thank you we for bringing that end in, too. That's great. Well, I think that's a, that's a very nice point to end on. Peter, thank you for joining us today. It's been a terrific discussion. All right, I have a, a few more comments to make as we close out today. Um, you've heard about a lot of, I think, very challenging but also very important policy issues. Uh, these bookends with Speaker Gingrich at the beginning, uh, Dr. Orzag at the end, uh, who both emphasized the fundamental importance of getting these issues for innovation right, uh, both because innovation is so important for improving health and because what we do with medical technology can have such an impact on the cost of our healthcare systems as well as health outcomes uh, as well. And I think you heard some common themes during the day around starting with uh, in panel one, we talked about reimbursement system reforms that are happening now that are at least trying to move in the direction of paying more for care and by extension for medical technologies that are having a bigger impact uh, on health and avoiding unnecessary costs in the process. Uh, we talk from there in panels two and three about not only examples of how these reimbursement changes were starting to affect medical technology, but also some possible pathways forward to solve the very difficult challenges of getting good information, reliable information, information that matters to consumers, to patients, about outcomes of different ways of treating their problems is increasingly going to matter as we move hopefully quickly into a more personalized uh, era of medical care and biomedical innovation. Uh, to solve these challenges, you heard about some ideas for collaboration from both the public and private side about understanding better uh, what kinds of outcome information we needed uh, to help support these kinds of reforms and to develop models using not competitive data, but pre-competitive information, uh, better applications of research science, uh, really uh, an, either an engineering science or is referred to as a development uh, science as well, for bringing better evidence to bear for measurement, for supporting uh, all of these kinds of reforms. So there can be potentially some greater alignment, uh, uh, not just in support of valuable medical technologies, but in support of the reimbursement reforms for providers and uh, insurance reforms facing consumers, all of whom uh, have a shared interest in getting the most value and the most personalized, uh, individualized effective care possible. Um, we have more work to do in this area. I uh, want to 
let you know that this uh, collaboration for this effort between Brookings and, and USC here uh, is uh, one step uh, in a further process to uh, develop this kind of evidence and to build on the kinds of ideas that were presented today. So, uh, so more to come on this. Uh, but in the meantime, I want to thank you all for supporting uh, an excellent discussion here today. So uh, on behalf of the Engelberg Center at Brookings, the Schaefer Center at USC, uh, we want to thank our uh, core supporters, Leonard Schaefer and Al Engelberg, who's here uh, with us today. Also want to thank my co-hosts, Dana Goldman and uh, the Schaefer Center team, Darius Lakdawalla, Dana McMurtry, Brian, Brandon Blair, Alice Liu, and Devin Stambler, who all contributed a lot to making this possible. And all the real work for these things gets done uh, beforehand. Uh, and also our team at Brookings, uh, Larry Cocott, Beth Rafferty, Aaron Carnes, Aaron Weireter, Ben Martin, uh, Alexandra Barbie, Michelle Wong, and uh, Josh Pfeiffer, and especially uh, Josh Benner for putting this together. Special thanks to our speakers and, of course, to, to all of you for making this discussion possible. We'll look forward to continuing to work with you and continue to have events like this one on critical issues uh, in healthcare and health reform in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you all very much, and please enjoy your weekends.